How did you get to get it? Hi, I'm Naomi Firestone Teeter. I'm the Executive Director of the Jewish Book Council, and I'm thrilled to be able to welcome you to the second program in Season 3 of Unpacking the Book, Jewish Writers in Conversation. Three years ago, we began unpacking the book with the goal of bringing together authors of fiction and nonfiction who have written works of concern to the Jewish community for thoughtful and smart conversations. We have been enriched, educated, and entertained and I have no doubt that tonight's event, Good Girls, Nasty Women, will continue in this tradition. And with March being Women's History Month, the timing couldn't be better. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the Jewish Book Council, our mission is to make sure that Jewish books are written and published, guide those books to readers, and spark dialogue about those works. From public programs such as this one, awards and conferences, to essays, by Jewish authors, book club resources, interviews and reading lists, JBC provides tools for substantive conversations about Jewish life and identity. Find out more at jewishbookcouncil.org or you can pick up a rap card on your way out. In addition, we wouldn't be here tonight with a few wonderful partners, so please allow me a moment to tell you about these wonderful institutions. Our co-sponsor for tonight's event is the Jewish Women's Archive a national organization dedicated to collecting and promoting the stories and voices of Jewish women. JWA explores the past as a framework for understanding the issues important to women today and uses Jewish women's stories to excite people of all genders and ages to see themselves as agents of change. I hope you'll explore their amazing resources, including educational resources, online exhibits, a book club, oral history tools, and a podcast at jwa.org, and they also have some flyers around that you should pick up. We are also grateful to the support of our media sponsor, Tablet Magazine, the premier publication of Jewish news and ideas in the U.S. For more literary news and original fiction, read Tablet in print, on the web at tabletmag.com, and subscribe to their weekly podcast, Unorthodox, on iTunes. And of course, a special thank you is in order to our team at our host institution, the Jewish Museum, Jenna, Will, and David. Thank you so much. <laughs> Finally, I'd like to extend my gratitude to the Jewish Book Council's Board of Directors for all their support, and to JBC staff for all their hard work to make tonight's event possible. Especially Nat Bernstein, who has orchestrated so many of the program details tonight, and Miri Pomeranz Dauber, who created tonight's book club handout, which we encourage you to take on your way out. You can find copies at the book sale table over there. Following this evening's program, we welcome you to join us for a book sale, author signing, which will be over here, and reception until 8.30. We hope that you'll be as inspired as we have been by the authors on tonight's panel. So be sure to purchase copies of all of their books this evening, as well as Jewish Book Council's new literary magazine, Paper Brigade. Before I introduce you to our lovely moderator, I'd like to ask that you please silence or shut down your cell phones. Thank you. And now on to Barry. Our moderator for tonight's event is Barry Weiss, Associate Book Review Editor at the Wall Street Journal. Before joining the book review, she worked as an op-ed editor at the journal and continues to write regular profiles and op-eds for the page. For two years, Barry was a senior editor at Tablet Magazine, where she edited the site's political and news coverage. She's also written for Haaretz, The Forward, and The New York Sun. Be sure to look for Barry on New York One, where she talks about new books she likes on a segment called The Book Reader. And with that, I thank you so much for joining us, and enjoy the evening. Thank you. Thanks, Naomi, and thank you all so much for coming. We're thrilled to have such an incredible crowd of people to talk about such an interesting issue and three incredibly interesting books. Before I introduce uh, the three women to my left, uh, on your seats, there should be note cards and maybe pencils. At some point in about 45 minutes, Jewish Book Council members will go around and we'll do the Q&A that way. So we'll collect all of the questions and then I'll ask them. Okay, so there's a lot of puffery on the internet these days about squad goals, girl bosses, badass chicks. Um, a lot of it, I think, is, is a little ridiculous, but I, I really am honored to be here with three of the most incisive, smart, sharp, thoughtful feminist writers um, in the country today, and I'm, I'm thrilled to introduce them to you. 
So right to my left is Lynn Povich. Lynn is an award-winning journalist who began her career at Newsweek as a secretary. In 1975, she became the first female senior editor in the magazine's history. Since leaving Newsweek in 1991, Lynn has been an editor-in-chief of Working Woman, a managing editor and senior executive for MSNBC.com, and a consultant to the New York Times Foundation. Oh, and in case you haven't seen it, Amazon has made a beloved TV show based on her book. Please join me in welcoming Lynn. In the middle, we have Bonnie Anderson. Bonnie has taught history and women's studies at Brooklyn College and the Graduate Center of the City University of New York for 30 years. She's a pioneer in the field of women's history and lectures throughout Europe and the United States on women's movements, international feminism, and the history of sexuality. The rabbi's atheist daughter, Ernestine Rose, international feminist pioneer, is her fourth book. Please join me in welcoming Bonnie. And last but not least, we have the fearsome Rebecca Traster. She is a writer at large for New York Magazine and a contributing editor at Elle. She is a National Magazine Award finalist and has written about women in politics, media, and entertainment from a feminist perspective for the New Republic, Salon, and many, many other publications. Her first book, Big Girls Don't Cry, about women in the 2008 election, was a New York Times notable book of 2010, and her latest book is All the Single Ladies. Please join me in welcoming Rebecca. So I thought I would start, start off the evening by talking a little bit about my 21-year-old sister, who is a student at Michigan and is sort of living out a very feminist reality, in my view, as are all of her friends. And when we, when we talked right before the election, we were talking about feminism, and then, of course, after, during the Women's March, and she told me that almost none of her friends identify as feminist. And I'm wondering if you guys can sort of make your pitch to women of that generation, or really anyone here in this room, who might be squeamish about the F word. Is it worth reclaiming to those who... You like that? Is it worth reclaiming to those for whom it's been lost? Should should we move on and just talk about more specific issues? Uh, and if you Did can you take it up. Did you talk to her before the election or after the election? Uh, both. Is that microphone on, by the way? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, because I think what's, uh, I mean, many of us have agonized that younger women didn't want to be identified as feminists for a long time. Um, those of us who are proud feminists it really hurt us, especially those of us who have daughters and thought that, you know, we were raising... Uh, them to embrace feminism too. But, you know, that started to change with the celebrities. And then, you know, with this election, I think one of the few silver linings of this election is younger women got it. They understood the kind of misogyny that was in this, uh, in our society. And they have been galvanized by this, and they are out there, and they are protesting, and they are organizing, and they are pushing. And I really feel that, you know, for the first time in a long time, feminism is actually being uh, revitalized again. So I know Rebecca and I have a slightly different point of view, perhaps. Well, I would agree with Lynn, and thank you, Beyonce. Uh, <laughs> Wait, thank you, Beyonce, or thank you, Donald? What I'm hearing is thank you, maybe Donald Trump. Well, um, I used to advertise my course on the history of feminism as the F word. And I would turn my back to the classroom and say, what are your associations with feminism? And it would be unshaved legs, man-hating women, you know, all sorts of things like that. But I do think it has changed. And I was tremendously heartened by the Women's March and all the signs that people had made. So I, I hope we're seeing a resurgence. Yeah, I would also date it to well before the Women's March and well before, which, which doesn't, obviously you're hearing something from your sister at Michigan, um, but I mean, as somebody, I'm 42, so I was in high school and college in the 1990s, which was the really frozen tundra of backlash. <laughs> and, and it is not, I mean, it's really not an exaggeration to say that when I, I was always interested in um, feminism, but it was, it always seemed to me to be a historic artifact. Um, I did go to marches, reproductive rights marches in 92 when I was in high school. Um, but when I was in college, if, you know, you could have been at the LGBT 
fun vegan potluck and you could have said like who here is a feminist and not a hand would be raised. It was absolutely toxic <laughs> at that point in the 90s and even when I started out in journalism there was no sense. I wrote for the New York Observer. It was like a total um, throwback you know, boys club in many, many ways, a wonderful place at the time in certain ways. Um, but there could be no, there was no sort of feminist, but Kath Apollett and um, it was like the person who was writing in journalism about feminism and that was, that was it when I was a young journalist. There was no sense that there was a feminist media, but well before actually coming out of, I, I date it a little bit in media to the 2004 election when you had the birth of the net roots around Howard Dean's campaign and there were inequities in that media world, in that blogging world where some of the women who were involved in the online presence around, Hall, uh, around Howard Dean, just as we saw in earlier generations, felt frustrated and they sort of launched a political blogosphere, and you got sites like Feministing, then like Jezebel, um, and a, a, a interest in feminism has really been growing over the past decade, so that when I go to colleges now, there are these big groups of young people, and it's also young people often who are doing the work of doing abortion funding, um, who are that activist. Tons of young women worked on Hillary Clinton's campaign. There are all kinds of things to be said about young women and Hillary Clinton, but a lot of the young women who were enthusiastic about her didn't get covered didn't really get seen. Um, there were also, of course, young people who were behind Bernie Sanders' campaign for a lot of very activist, very feminist reasons. So um, I actually think this has been building. Do you think that, how do you think that the people of the younger generation are defining it? Does it, does, meaning, is it intersectional feminism? Is it, can you speak to that a little bit maybe, Rebecca? Yeah, I think young people are really determined to do what I think generations of people in the women's movement have been working on, um, which is putting together what is called an intersectional movement, in, um, which takes into account all kinds of different biases that different kinds of women and the people in their lives uh, experience. And so that means um, ensuring that a feminist movement is working alongside and is in some instances one and the same with the Black Lives Matter movement, um, with environmental justice movements, um, and in addition to reproductive justice movements, reproductive rights movements. Um, and I think young people are really determined to do this. And um, it's been something that has, you know, because feminism is a majority movement, um, it is a movement that's aiming for the equality and liberation of more than half of our population. And that means that it's such a mass number of people you want to represent that it's very difficult to conceive of it as a movement that wouldn't have internal strife, disagreement, competing perspectives, and ideas about what direction it should move in. Um, and in fact, majorities are often divided, uh, you know, subjugated majorities are often um, kept subjugated by dividing them against each other. And so divisions about race, religion, class, ethnicity, um, you know, have always from the beginning been used to sort of weaken and divide feminism. And I think there's a new generation that wants to try, once again, to move beyond that. And you know, it's a very delicate project. It's very difficult. One of the things that I think is so wonderful about the pairing of these three books is it gives us an incredible arc, starting with the 19th century with Ernestine Rowe's feminist pioneer to the second waivers of Lynn's book up until uh, Rebecca's book, which is about women in our generation. Um, so I'm wondering maybe, Bonnie, if we can start with you. Let's go back to the 1800s and hear a little bit about this woman who I had never heard of and was kind of amazed by her story. Thank you. Um, I, how many people have heard of Ernestine Rose before tonight? See, not very many, and this is the audience that would know about it, right? Uh, so she was um, a born the only child of a Polish rabbi in 1810, and raised as all, almost all Jews were Orthodox, and she uh, went, she, she was not a good girl. She, she was a bad girl. Uh, she used to say, I was a rebel by the age of five because her father sent her to a hater, to a Jewish school, and she was punished for something she didn't know was wrong. And she then said to him, I don't want to go there anymore. And like many men who did not have sons, he, tra he raised her as a surrogate son. He taught her to read Hebrew and he taught her to discuss Torah with him. 
So she began to ask questions, and he said, little girls should not ask questions. But of course, little boys were supposed to ask questions. And she said she dated her interest in women's rights from that moment. When she was 12, she uh, questioned a saying in her town, which was a small city in the dead center of what used to be Poland, it didn't exist in those years, um, that you should keep the Sabbath under the breaking of a piece of straw. And she said, God, if you don't want me to break a piece of straw, let me know. <laughs> and when she didn't get a sign, she broke the straw, and she said that's when she broke with Judaism forever. When she was 15, her mother died and left her a fortune. And her father betrothed her to a man she didn't want to marry and wrote the marriage contract that if she didn't go through with the marriage, she, she, the fiancé would get the money. And that's the moment when she shows the backbone that led her into feminism. She hires a sleigh, goes 60 miles in the snow to the nearest Polish city, Kalish, and pleads her own case and wins. And she goes and what, back what year home. was that? I just want That's in 1827. So she's just turned 17. And her father has remarried a girl her own age, and she realizes she's not going to get on with the stepmother. So she leaves him some of the money and leaves Poland, her family, and Judaism forever. She lives for a couple of years in Berlin, she goes to Paris, then she ends up in London, where she finds a more congenial father, a socialist. And um, if you could just hold on that a little I'm sorry. And, and, and this is Robert Owen, who was a famous manufacturer who basically invented early childhood education, believed you could reform the world into a better place. And my guess is that this jived with her in part because it was Tikkun Olam, you know, that it was the same making the world better. And she calls him my dear father. And it's in that movement that she first speaks publicly, where she's treated as an equal, and where she meets her future husband, William Rose. Her maiden name was Patowska. And together, they emigrate to New York City in 1836. And they will live here for 33 years. And, and, and she begins political action right away. She takes a petition around Lower Manhattan for married women's property rights. Because in those years, a married woman, you know, it was, the saying was, husband and wife are one person, and that person is the husband. <laughs> so anything you owned, your purse, your wages, your earnings, your, your property, belonged to your husband. She gets six signatures in six months. But she never gives up. And it was through that movement that she began to meet other early women's rights leaders, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and other people. By the 1840s, she's speaking on behalf not just of women's rights and free thought, which was very controversial. Free thinkers were called infidels in that, those years, but also for abolition. And she believes deeply in human rights. And when you were talking about feminism and intersexual, intersectionality, I was thinking human rights. You know, that really is the basis of what we're demanding. And she becomes one of the most popular orators in the middle of the 19th century. She's extremely well known. She travels through 23 of the existing 31 states. And she's at every women's rights convention throughout the 1850s. But the Civil War causes a great disruption in the women's movement. She becomes ill. They end up in England. And by the 1920s, she's been completely forgotten. To what extent is her atheism the reason that she's forgotten, if at all? I was asked to write a blog about why was she forgotten. Mm -hmm. Was it that she was a foreigner, a Jew, an atheist, or a woman? Um, <laughs> And I, I think you know the answer. <laughs> atheism was extremely unpopular in those years, but she muted her atheism at the women's rights and the abolitionist movements. She would never, you know, for instance, she always called religion superstition. She doesn't do that there. Mm. When people try to introduce the Bible, she says, well, you know, American, uh, the colonists wouldn't have been able to revolt if they'd consulted the Bible. So she mutes it. 
Uh, a foreigner, she's the only non-native-born person in either the abolitionist or the women's rights movement. Um, and she's always called a foreigner. But I don't think that's a reason to be forgotten, maybe moving back to England. A Jew, this is a period where there are very, very few Jews in the United States of America. There are like 150,000 Jews in this country in 1860, a population of 31 million. And she suffers certainly some anti-Semitism. But honestly, I think she was forgotten because there was no women's history. When I was growing up, there was Dolly Madison and Molly Pitcher. <laughs> and that was about it. And the Boston Investigator, which is the closeted name of the US atheist newspaper, predicted in 1870 that in 100 years, Ernestine Rose will be appreciated. And I think it was women's history that did it. Wow. Thanks, Pani. Um, so if Ernestine Rose is a bad girl, tell us about the good girls. <laughs> of the Good Girls Revolt. Um, tell us about this book, why you wrote it, and, and some, of the, some of the people that it talks about, including you. Well, not everyone in the second wave was a good girl. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, you know, we were uh, post-war women. Um, we were expected to get married and have children and support our husbands. Um, and we believed, and this is what the good girls really meant. It didn't mean sexually. It meant that we believed that if you um, worked hard, you did well, you were polite, that you would get ahead in the world, you would get the right guy, um, and that you would do well. And that's really what sort of good girls really meant, because there were a lot of bad girls in that population, thank goodness, who really pushed um, for rights. So there we were at Newsweek where only men were hired as reporters, writers, and editors, and only women as researchers, and rarely promoted out of that category. Um, and in 1969, um, we decided, uh, one of the women found out from her friend, who was a lawyer, that segregating jobs by gender was illegal. And once we realized it was actually illegal, this is five years after the Civil Rights Act, and we didn't really understand the Civil Rights Act applied to women, even though it said sex in the act, uh, where you couldn't discriminate because of sex. We sort of thought it was much more about the civil rights movement and about blacks. Um, when we realized it was immoral, that was sort of like, oh my god, we've got to do something about this. And that's when we began to organize and realize that we, um, we had to file a sex discrimination complaint against Newsweek with the Equal Employment Opportunities Commission. And the complication was, we love Newsweek. Newsweek was a great magazine. It was an important magazine. It was the progressive magazine to time. We just wanted to make it better for women. We didn't want to get fired. Uh, we wanted to work there, but we wanted to get promoted. So here we were organizing in our workplaces under our bosses' noses um, to ultimately sue them. And we knew if they found out they would fire all of us. Um, once we filed the suit, we could be protected by the law. So um, it was a very sort of scary time. And to this day, I have to say, one of the great sort of feminist things about this story is there were ultimately 60 women who signed this complaint. And over the six months, or five or six months we organized, not one woman ratted us out which is pretty amazing to show the sort of determination and the commitment to doing this. Um, anyway, the day that Newsweek did a cover story on the women's movement called Women in Revolt, <laughs> we announced that we were filing sex discrimination. <laughs> In the book, you sort of talk about how it set off a wave of other suits at other publications. Can you speak a little bit about that? Yeah, it was very interesting. Um, the day after we sued, a reporter from the New Statesman called a friend of hers at Fortune and said, well, the women at Newsweek have sued. Are you going to do anything? And she said, oh, well, that's a good idea. <laughs> um, so three months after we filed our complaint, the women at Fortune, the women at Time Magazine, and the women at Sports Illustrated all filed complaints. And then the floodgates opened. I mean, women at the Associated Press 
at NBC, at the New Haven Register, at Newsday, and ultimately at the New York Times and the Washington Post, both four years after we filed our complaint, all filed suit. And women at all of these new news organizations were encouraged to organize and press for charges. One last question. Were your male colleagues supportive, skeptical? How did it work sort of internally? I mean, some were and, and some weren't. Uh, most of us worked very closely with the male writers, and many of the male writers were quite supportive. Um, you know, they were raised in this atmosphere too, and as one of them said, who was married to a professional journalist, oh my God, you know, here I am writing about blacks and civil rights, and right under my nose, we've been oppressing this whole group of women. You know, it just, that was the culture, you know, that was the click moment. Everyone had theirs, and sort of, it woke up a lot of the men who, who did appreciate the fact that we were smart, we checked their copy, we reported for them, and they knew, they knew that we were talented. One of the problems was that it was affirmative action period, and a lot of people were against affirmative action. They believed that the only reason you were gonna get ahead was because you were a woman or because you were a black and not because you had the talent. So a lot of the men were sort of against this affirmative action thing. A lot of them were angry that we had laundered our dirty laundry in public. Um, and a lot of the men just were not only angry, but also didn't believe that women had this talent. We used to say, you know, writing for Newsweek was a God-given talent, but it was only given to men. <laughs> so there were men who felt that way, and the first brave women who decided to try, do a writing tryout, even though they were being published in the New York Times, and the Atlantic, and The Voice, all failed their tryouts because their editors did not want them to succeed. Uh, Rebecca, your book, um, there, there's this quote in it uh, from, I think, 1877, where Susan B. Anthony talks about the coming epoch of single women. And you say that that epoch is now upon us, and it's just as radical a development as the sexual revolution or the pill. Tell us why. Um, well, it's what, what we're living through. The, I came to writing my book book initially thinking it was just going to be a book of contemporary journalism because we're living in this period in which the rates of marriage um, are plummeting and the age of first marriage is getting ever further delayed. Um, and what that means for women especially who historically have been marriage among many other things has been a relationship based on dependence. Um, women have been economically, sexually and socially dependent on men um, until very recently, and for a whole number of reasons, um, starting you know with the founding and moving through the 19th century and into the social movements of the 20th century, and um, what we now live in is an era in which women can live outside of marriage, in which they can um, have economic stability without being married to a man, in which they can have a liberated sex life without being married to a man um, and not risk social censure. Obviously, women have had liberated, have had sex lives without being married or outside of marriage <laughs> forever. Um, in which they can have families, in which they can have children outside of marriage. Um, and the patterns, the, the whole organization of adult life is changing around us. There are now more unmarried people in the United States than there are married people. Um, the, the median age of first marriage, which for women, for as long as they were keeping track, which goes back to 1890, but in fact, I think we can be pretty sure that this was true even before 1890, up through 1980, um, the median, despite many fluctuations in the marriage rate over those over that 90 years, the median age of first marriage for women fluctuated only between 20 and 22. So, um, in periods where people were marrying a lot and in periods where they were marrying a little, women were still marrying at the beginning of their adulthood in order to have an adult life. Your adulthood had to be kind of ratified by an entrance into this institution, which the institution also organized gendered power. Um, and by 1990, the marriage age had jumped, for that median marriage age, had jumped to 23.9. And in 2010, um, it was over 27, and it's higher than that in many cities for the median age of first marriage for women. So that means that women's adulthoods are, are now mapped entirely differently around possibilities for um, 
work, education, sex, love, friendship, tra you know, children, um, they can now move in millions of different directions where for generations, for centuries, everybody was sort of herded into this one, onto this one path. Um, and and if, you, if you didn't take that path, you were a real anomaly. And now being unmarried for some portion of your adult life, and in many cases for all of your adult life, um, is no longer the same kind of anomaly that it was before. So that's what I mean when, it's, when I say it's revolutionary. We can just conceive of what adulthood could look like and feel like and, the, and, and be shaped like for women in ways that were unthinkable really, uh, certainly as norms, um, even 30 or 40 years ago. How is it changing our politics? Well, it should be changing our politics a lot more. Um, Say more. <laughs> than it has. <laughs> I mean, one of the things that I would argue is that a lot of um, <laughs> the intensity of the pushback that we're seeing right now in our politics um, is to the advancement of women and, and people of color, people living um, in new ways and asking new things of the government. So in terms of social and economic policy, there are a million ways. Basically, we've had this system where the government has supported a division, you know, historically the government has supported a gendered division of labor and power um, and offered everything from sort of tax breaks to business and housing loans and, and built infrastructure for a population that was taking advantage of it economically, that population was male. And that male population was presumed to be able to live the public lives as earners in part, this is also, for white men, this is also the, the population that was enfranchised from the founding and whose, enfr and whose enfranchisement was protected um, throughout the country's history. Um, basically, the government in all kinds of ways afforded white men all kinds of economic, social, and professional, and political power. Um, and through failing to uh, have workplace protections or protect equal pay or um, protect against hiring discrimination and sexual harassment, um, disadvantaged women in workplaces, ensuring that there was a class of low paid and unpaid labor that did the domestic work that made men's public earning and political lives possible, right? This is how, and the government fully participated in, in this in, in lots of ways. When we talk about policies um, like paid leave, uh, like subsidized childcare, uh, part of what we're talking about is asking the government to consider re reworking how it sees how its citizens are living and that now both men and women are in workforces. Both men and women are also doing the domestic labor in ways that they haven't before. When we talk about raising a minimum wage, that's about address two thirds of minimum wage workers are women. Half of minimum wage workers are, are single women, are single mothers. So we are talking about asking the government to take a look at how Americans are now living and how they're organizing their lives, how they're participating in workforces and domestically, and saying you need to readdress how you, how you make policy to support your citizens as they are now living, as opposed to how they lived 50 years ago, let alone 200 years ago. So when we talk about the stuff that was so sent, that you know, probably should have been more central. Um, but Hillary Clinton was the first presidential candidate ever to run on paid leave legislation. I'm wondering if we can talk a little bit about tactics. One of the things that interested me about uh, Rose and certainly. Uh, the women in the Good Girls Revolt is that they sort of nodded to um, traditional norms, like for example, that she didn't wear bloomers and that the women in your book, many of them were married um, and, and their husbands were supportive of their careers and sort of involved in the suit. I'm wondering if you guys can talk a little bit about um, the efficacy of that sort of tactic, meaning that you can get more done maybe if you nod to traditional norms and mores. Well, Rose is an interesting combination. She always calls herself Ernestine Louise Rose. That is, she always uses her married name, unlike a number of women in the women's movement at the day. And she always wears the horribly constricting dress of the 19th century with corsets and long skirts. 
but she's incredibly radical in her pronouncements. When Rebecca was talking, I, th I was thinking of Rose's remark that white men are a minority in this country. White women, black men, and black women are the majority. And that was her consistent position. Um, by muting her atheism, she made it possible to function in basically a Christian population. So I think some kind of accommodation is necessary. But I think I'm hopeful that the, uh, what we're seeing today is the last gasp of the old white male patriarchy. Um, <laughs> can have a long tail. I mean, this is this is the thing that's, I, I completely agree that that is, that's why we're seeing Donald Trump didn't arrive out of nowhere. He arrived, and enthusiasm for him arrived in part in response to two administrations of our first black president and the threatened presidency of the first woman. Um, you know, the, the sentiments that, and we, there are a million arguments about what happened in November, but, but I I think it's pretty inarguable that he ran on a campaign that was fueled certainly in large part by open racism, xenophobia, and misogyny, and that that tapped into something in this country is exactly, it's that last gasp, but it can have that minority, that angry minority, um, resentful about being displaced from power can exert its power deep into the future. I mean, the, the sort of comforting, like, oh, well, demographics will see us out, um, won't work if actually um, there's not policy in place if we have a Supreme Court and we have executive branches and, and um, state legislatures that are going to enforce white male dominance deep, deep into the future. Lynn, what about you? Well, I, I don't know that our, you know, our tactics were, you know, because any of us were married and the men were supportive. I mean, there were supportive men at Newsweek, but basically we had to go to court. I mean, we had to, we had to do something legal because um, just before we were organizing, the best writers at Newsweek, all men, were very unhappy and had gone to the bosses and said, we're really unhappy, there's too much editing, there's not enough voice, blah, blah, blah. And each of them was taken to lunch by an editor. Yes, yes, we're going to change, things will change, and nothing happened. And we figured, well, if they're not going to do that for the best people on the magazine, they're certainly not going to do it for the lowest of the low and the women. So our tactic was simply, you know what, we're not going to go to management and tell them our problem, we're going to sue them. Were there any people, uh, there's a scene in the book, I forget which publication, but I think it's Shulamit Firestone is like on a desk screaming in an editor, sort of oh, like yeah, a banshee, but, and she sort of, yeah, can you tell that story? Because so, that was a different sort of tactic. Yeah, right after, a couple days after us, a, a group of media women, actually, I was part of the group uh, called the Women's Media Group, decided that the women's magazines were really terrible in terms of the way they presented the image of women. And so a group of them decided that they were going to hold um, John Mac Carter, the editor of the Ladies' Home Journal, hostage. <laughs> so one morning they crept in the building, they walked up, they, they, at eight o'clock, they went up the stairwells, not the elevator, and about 50 of them went into his office and refused, this was the period of sit-ins, you know, at Columbia, refused to leave. And they kept him captive for about 12 hours. And they read a whole list of everything that was wrong with the Ladies Home Journal and all the articles and what it was, you know, portraying women as and demanding that they take over the magazine, that he promote women, that he pay his secretaries and so on and so forth. Um, it was very much of the times and it got a lot of, um, it got a lot of press. And in the end, they ended up negotiating where John Mac Carter gave the women one issue of the Ladies Home Journal in August to edit. And no, no, no one reads in August. No paid, <laughs> no paid le um, family leave, which they asked for. No raises for any of the women who work there. No promotions, nothing. Um, but they thought that you know this would sort of be the shock tactic. And all of the women's magazines, Ladies Home Journal, Red Book, um, Good House, they were all edited by men. And it would take uh, another probably five to seven years for the first woman to edit one of the magazines, Shane Alexander. Can you each weigh in sort of 30 seconds, a minute each, on what you think the priorities of the women's movement should be today? 
I know it's a small question. In the, mean, in the meantime, if the Jewish Book Council folks want to go around and collect questions, you could just raise your hand and they'll grab the card from you. Well, I think doing away with the old white male patriarchy would be a wonderful start. I mean, uh, the kind of things that Rebecca has been talking about. Uh, paid childhood leave, um, equal salary. I'd love to see an equal rights amendment passed. Um, it just know. got ratified in Nevada, by yes. the way, on Monday. The ERA was ratified in Nevada. I mean, one of the difficult truths <laughs> is not all women are feminists and not all men are anti-feminist. You know, so you find your allies where you can. Um, but the reason I think of it as an old movement, honestly, is my half-brother, a member of the Tea Party who voted for Trump, and he, he feels he's on the way out. And he's 81, so. <laughs> You know, uh, dark. <laughs> given the hand that we've been dealt since November, I guess my priority now um, is to get women in office and to get the right women and the right men in office. You know, because you can see exactly what happens when the right people are not in office. And I know it'll take time, but um, I know a lot of women have stepped up now and are training to run for office. And, you know, it's not just a gender thing. I don't want, I always say this. You know, there are a lot of great men out there who are terrific and they should run and there are a lot of women who aren't terrific and they shouldn't run. So you need the right <laughs> women and the right men. But I, I just feel right now we're in a political moment where we have to start rebuilding from the ground up. Rebecca? Um, I certainly agree with that. I think we should endeavor to make our democracy actually representative, which it certainly is not. Um, I mean, it's, it really is. And, and I... Um, I think more broadly, I, this is a very bad answer because it's a non-answer, uh, but it goes back to the question about intersectionality. So I've thought for so long about, um, again, with a majority movement, the idea of coming up with one set of priorities is, um, is not only impractical, um, it just would create, it creates tremendous strife. Um, and so one of the things that's been interesting to me watching the, the Women's March movement coalesce, and it hasn't always been smooth, but boy, it was successful in its, in its public um, expression, um, has been that there are all these organizers out there, right? When we talk about paid leave, and I talked about how it was on Clinton's platform, for 20 years, paid leave advocate, advocates have been working at state and local levels to get paid leave passed in states. We're gonna, New York State is gonna have paid leave. Tremendous, actually a really great, strong paid leave program. It's gonna phase in over the next few years. It'll be a few years before people can take advantage of it. That's because of the work of organizers. Um, criminal justice um, advocates have been organizing uh, at local and state levels all around the country. Um, uh, obviously, reproductive justice groups organize. I think one of the goals of the women's movement right now um, has to be a more active promotion of communication between all these different people who are doing the work of organizing and um, sort of making effective messaging about how women can contribute to, to the areas that they're passionate and interested about. So I think of it as less about coming, I, I think something like um, better political representation is absolutely crucial because I am among those who thinks it will make a difference even though there will be horrible women, uh, you know, who are on the right who I'll very eagerly vote against. But um, but I, I also think that it's it's about envisioning a women's movement in which the people who are doing the tremendous work of organizing and change can be talking more to each other and envisioning themselves as part of a women's movement where where the women's part is, is front and center. So speaking of women on the right, I guess I'll offer myself up. I'm conservative about certain issues and it seems to me that one of my fears is that feminism seems like it's becoming something that is where, where, where you're only welcome if you share extremely progressive politics. And we've seen that um, in sort of the, the brouhaha about um, Zionist place in the women's movement. I know it's a sensitive question, but I'm wondering if, if you guys can address that. And if you think that feminism means um, ascribing to this kind of longer and longer set of progressive polit policies. <laughs> No, 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 I'm actually, I, I think that the idea that 
feminism is a club that can accept or reject you um, is largely an anti-feminist myth. Feminism belongs to whoever takes up the mantle. I argued this about Sarah Palin in 2008 when she was running around calling herself a feminist. And you know, there were a lot of people. If you argued that she was one, if she called herself it or not. No, I argued that feminism belongs, like the, this, again, because it has such a long, varied, diverse, and often combative history, the notion of what a women's movement is, is regularly changing and morphing. And in fact, um, I, I just think that the notion that you can be kicked out isn't right. What is right is that if you want to participate, you're going to face fights within it, fights about how is what you believe good f for women's advancement? How does it get women closer to gender equality? How and so once you're in the conversation, I think feminism is inherently um, welcoming because you can't. They're never going to like you know take away your razor blade and, and your um, you know and and take away your membership card. There aren't membership cards. So you would agree that the movement itself might be hostile to say pro-life women? Um, that's, that's a big issue within the, the women's movement. And I, I look forward to young people changing the terms. The second the word pro-life came out, the battle was lost. I wouldn't fight on abortion. I'd fight on contraception. Mm -hmm. I mean, most people who are opposed to abortion are also opposed to contraception, and yet almost everybody believes in contraception. And I think that changes the whole battle. And I would agree with Rebecca. It's not, it, it, it is going to be conflict. It always is. You know, uh, being together means conflict. And it's not all going to be one rosy, happy party, but I think we can get a lot done. I also don't think it's. I don't think it's new. I don't think we're. In, I don't think we're in a position. You know, the way that you put it is, um, it's growing ever more. Um, you know, ever more dependent on sharing these same progressive values. Um, I don't think that's new, at all. I think that a lot of what we talk about when we talk about the women's movement inherently lends itself to overlap with larger progressive projects, whatever they may be in that instance. And so this is, this is um, something that I don't think is becoming more acute right now. What's becoming acute, or what makes it feel acute, is that the, the conversation's getting louder, yes. which is a good thing. And the fights are getting louder. That's a good thing, too. I don't see the fights about who belongs in the movement as bad for the movement. I see it as a sign of life and an attempt to account for change. fights about um, transgender politics, um, yes, about Israel and Zionism, about uh, abortion, and and you know I would, we probably all have different answers to all of those questions, different perspectives on all of those. The fact that we're talking about it means that the women's movement is a living, breathing thing that we're arguing about what direction we're supposed to steer it in. That's a good thing, and I think that's what you're responding to, not that like there's a litmus test that's getting more intense. Also, I think the feminist movement has always been a radical movement. However you want to talk about radical, if you're a conservative, you don't like the word. But it was a radical movement from the very beginning, and it continues to be. And it always had deep divisions. I mean, the women's movement split after the Civil War with those people who wanted the black man's vote and those who wanted the vote for all women as well. Okay, one question from the audience. Uh, one of the hallmarks of the current feminist movement is the increased accessibility to knowledge via the internet. Can you speak about the role of, there we go, social media for current and future feminist movements? Well, I mean, I, I think that uh, it's really helped the movement a lot. And I, you know, I worked at MSNBC in the time of the beginning of the internet when most of the internet sites were really controlled by uh, computer guys because uh, it, it it was all these engineers who created Microsoft and, and all, 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 all these um, CompuServe, if you remember all that stuff. With social media, it was sort of the door open to women because women are really good at networking, at conversation, at the kind of um, language that's used in social media. And so you'll find that not only are women in social media, but they use social media very effectively. And it's, as Rebecca said, even starting with the zines in the early days of the 2004, I mean, it really, social media really didn't come in until probably, um, I don't know, eight, ten. Um, so just, you know, six, seven years ago, we 
we've just writ witnessed this rise, but it's, I think it's really helped a lot of the movements and certainly the organizing and the ability to gather, protest, and be effective. I don't want to say a good word about trolling, but I do think <laughs> I do think that it has brought you know rampant misogyny out in the open, and you know between Gamergate or what they did to Leslie Jones, you know it's there. People can't ignore it. Uh, how can we make our boys feminists in the era of Donald Trump? <laughs> Have them do the dishes. <laughs> I don't, I don't see that Donald Trump is necessarily going to affect our, our sons in a particular, I mean, they, they're individuals, they have their own abilities to determine, you know, what's a good person, what's, a, what's somebody who's a liar, I mean, they're no different from anybody else. Um, I, I do think that, um, you know, we are seeing a real change in a lot of men uh, who have been raised by certainly working mothers and feminist mothers. Um, and, and you see more and more that certainly young men today want to be far more involved in raising their children than my father's generation wanted to be, and who are also stigmatized themselves when they take flex time or take paternity leave. You know, They are considered not serious in their careers. So actually I have a lot of hope for younger men that, you know, that, that their issues are sort of uh, becoming much more common to what women have put up with. I actually think that the that Trump's election um, has had a startling impact on kids that I don't know that we can predict what's going to come from it. Um, but and not just in my sort of lefty Brooklyn enclave where they where I have a six year old daughter and um, where the kindergartners truly they I mean view him as a monster as a bad guy from you know and and the fact that he so shockingly came to power by beating um, a woman, uh, I think will make a big impression. And, and again, it's not just in Brooklyn. I mean, I've traveled a lot since the election and I hear this actually all over the country um, in both cities and more rural areas that he is such a cartoon figure that for kids especially, he resonates. Um, and that's whether, whether these kids, boys and girls, are looking at him and thinking of the fact that um, he, you know, beat Hillary Clinton to get to the White House, or that he said terrible things about women, or that he's um, deporting their their friends, families, and parents. Um, he's a bad guy, and I think that I, again, I don't know how that plays out as this generation moves into adulthood. But I think for kids, this has probably had a traumatic effect that we that you know will make a difference in their lives. How do you explain how he won to your daughter? Has she asked that question? Oh yeah, we talked, she's obsessed with this. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but she knew, I mean, I didn't, I thought he might win. So it wasn't a, it was a shock in that by the end I was very hopeful. I actually did believe at the very end that Hillary was gonna win. But up until then, I had been really clear with her that Donald Trump might win. Um, yeah, I wanted, I was very scared through the, I was scared. I was scared 24 hours a day. And it was only maybe in the last week of October that I looked at the numbers and I began to feel not scared. I began to feel like, wait a minute, this is gonna happen. Um, and Rosie was actually the person, my six year old was the person who repeatedly, I was at the Javits Center on election night and she was home with my husband and she kept saying to my husband, it's gonna be okay. It's gonna be okay. <laughs> Don't worry. I mean in her mind, like there are only ever there's like it's just gonna be Hillary versus Donald Trump for the rest of her life. So she's like, Don't worry, Hillary will win next time. <laughs> my husband's like, you know, deep breathing on the couch. <laughs> um, but you know, they here's the thing, it's like fairy tales for kids that are incredibly violent and horrible, and as adults, you're like, oh my god, this is too horrible, all the parents are dead, and then they all, you know, and the kids are like, yeah, no, that's like, kids also have a capacity, and again, it's this cartoonish reduced, the bad guy, the bad guy won, and my, my daughter's kindergarten class then, I guess I probably shouldn't say this so publicly, because it's, but I'm gonna, um, <laughs> like, 
two weeks after the election, my daughter, who was making a card for her best friend Sasha with like rainbows and trees and flowers and like that blue sky that's only at the top of the paper. Yeah. And I was like, oh, it's beautiful. And I opened it up and it was like, dear Sasha, I love you so much. I'm so glad you're my friend. I was like, oh, honey, this is great. And I turned it over and in like brown marker it says, we have a plan to kill Donald Trump. <laughs> service of 
women's rights. And I think you are a model of a journalist who does. Yeah, I totally commit myself to Yeah, but, but I, I get to do that because I'm an opinion journalist and who also is a reporter. There's no, I, I'm very lucky that I have the kind of job that I have and the, and the niche that I get to fill where I don't have to be at all careful about being clear about what I, what I believe um, in, my, in my work, in my writing. Um, I have no religion. I was, I am not religiously um, observant in any direction. My mom was a Baptist potato farmer from Northern Maine, and my dad was a Jewish communist from the Bronx. And <laughs> so the thing though that was, and, and because when they married it caused a tremendous family drama, um, they both, neither of them were religious, and in fact, the fact that religion had gotten in the, way, in the way of their families accepting their marriage made them pretty aggressively non-observant. And so I was not raised in a religious house. But the thing that, the way I came to, I guess what I would conceive of as my Jewish identity, aside from the fact that I looked like I walked out of the Jewish girl factory, um, <laughs> is that I was, <laughs> and, um, is that I grew up in suburban Philadelphia in an Irish-Italian blue-collar neighborhood where I was really the only Jew in my elementary school, um, you know, and was like asked if I had horns and all this stuff, and um, through sixth grade. And then I went to a Quaker school in Philadelphia where I was like the only not Jewish person <laughs> and, <laughs> and was castigated horribly if I ever took a holy day off you know, but didn't go to shul. So, by like my friend's father, who was incredibly, anyway. So, I, I, but the other thing is that I think when I was young and first reading, right, when, my, when I was in elementary school and I was so acutely aware of the fact that even as a non-observant half-Jew, I was so Jewish in, amongst my friends, amongst my peers, um, and also, my dad had told me about the Holocaust from the time I was like two, and it loomed. I mean, and all my reading was uh, was about Jews um, and history, and the, you know um, Anne Frank and all kinds of other Lois Lowry, um, even the sort of you know the, when I was reading Judy Bloom, I was reading Sally J. Friedman, and I you know it was what my um, I was consumed often, and because I was reading books about girls, I think that's part of how I got to think about stories about girls. And so it's a very sideways way of saying that my interest in um, reading, about, not about Judaism, but about Jews. And as a little girl, that led me to stories about Jewish girls, all kind of family. I mean, I was always reading about Jewish girls. And they were often uh, quite badly behaved. And that was also, <laughs> which was, which was, also um, fascinating to me. And so I guess that that's probably the, the pathway. One of the last ones. Um, who, this is a great question. Who are the Ernestine Roses, the overlooked feminist pioneers of today? And if you don't have an answer to that, it's hard. Who are people that you all look up to right now in the women's movement? Yeah, well, I just, one of my very favorite people in, in, in electoral politics is, uh, is Barbara Lee, who's a representative from California. Um, and I can, cons I can say, uh, you know, she's not, she's not somebody who's gonna be like a presidential candidate. She's been in politics for a very long time. She got into politics, she was involved in the Black Panthers and got into politics in 1972 when Shirley Chisholm came to her campus and she um, wanted to work with her and wound up organizing uh, her presidential campaign in Northern California, and then she wound up being elected to the House of Representatives. She, in the past couple of years, has put forth the Each Woman Act, which is an attempt to overturn the Hyde Amendment, which is actually a absolutely key um, as far as when we talk about reproductive rights, and it's just been sort of considered untouchable for so long. The Hyde Amendment is what um, prevents federal insurance money from being spent, being spent on abortions. Um, she opposed the the Iraq war at every stage. Um, so she's, uh, I think, an under, just in terms of women in politics, we, we talk about women in politics, whether it's um, Clinton and Warren and Gillibrand and Kamala Harris um, and Nancy Pelosi, and even um, 
you know, some of the, the women in the, the house, Maxine Waters, who's, who's terrific, but Barbara Lee is a real hero of mine, and I don't think we talk about her enough. Well, I, I would say Kirsten Gillibrand, whom I, is not unknown, but I, I just admire her tremendously. Um, I don't know if you saw her interchange with the Marine General over the dreadful sexual harassment that was going on in the Marine Corps where they had all the pictures of naked Marine women. And he was like waffling and, oh, no, we'll do this. And she just kept going at him. What specifically are you planning to do? And she's made <coughs> sexual harassment in the military her issue, and I admire that. You know, I, I, I don't know that there's a single person. I know people are always trying to say who's the, you know, leader, this or that. And, and I, I guess um, there, there are two things that impress me. One is the movement for minimum wage and caring workers. I think the fact that our society has to come to terms with all the people who care for all of us and our families, and the minimum wage people, and all of those organizations that work for that and are pushing that, I, I just have enormous respect and admiration and hope that that really gets some traction in the next couple, couple of years. And I also think that the women artists out there today, the writers, the painters, uh, the creators of television and films, like Hidden Figures. I, I just think that there is an enormous amount of great work being done by a lot of women artists. Um, you would call them, they may call themselves feminists or not, but there's just a, a huge breadth now of women's experiences being explored, and, and I just think that's a fantastic thing. Um, before we wrap, I would love it if each of you could recommend a book that you love, it could be a feminist book, or it could be a book, I mean, I know Rebecca named like 20, but a book that set you off on your sort of feminist journey, something that maybe changed your life, that you think could change the life of someone else in this room. And in the meantime, I will give you guys a, a quick announcement, which is that afterwards, um, and this will be the last question, you should all buy these three wonderful books, and the authors will be sitting here and will be happy to, to sign them. My book didn't start me off um, because I didn't read the books I wanted to write, as it turned out, but I read a wonderful book that came out maybe seven years ago called Codename Verity, and it's a young adult novel that's based on the very strong friendship between two English women during World War II. One is a pilot, and one is a special operations, uh, I forget what the E stands for. And uh, the second one is captured by the Nazis. It's code name Verity. It's by Elizabeth Wien, W-E-I-N. And it's just a wonderful book based on women's history. She has a reading list at the end of what strong women can do under the worst of conditions. I think one of the books that really changed my life. I, I was a student at Vassar College and my professor was Linda Nocklin and she wrote a very famous essay. Uh, ultimately it became a book about why, they, why aren't there any great women artists. And that was sort of the very beginning. I mean there weren't even women's studies then, but that was the very beginning of looking at the lost history of women. Um, I think that part of a book that I've, I've since read, and now it, it reads very differently to me in retrospect, but it is true that Susan Faludi's backlash at the time that it came out helped me to understand that period of sort of um, frozen anti-feminism in which I'd come of age in a way that freed me um, to start thinking that maybe it could just be a stage and could be undone. And as I said, I, I recently went back um, and reread it, and I, and I actually feel very differently about it now, but at the time, um, it helped me tremendously to conceive of the period in which I was becoming an adult. Thank you all so much for coming.